Hello and welcome to your lecture for ankle and leg pathologies. This uh, lecture will be broken up into a two-part series. The first part of this series is really going to be focused in on ankle and leg anatomy. So we'll skip the foot and the toes because we've already had that online lecture. Um, so this will be a brief anatomical lecture on the ankle and leg. And then I'll follow this up with an online lecture for ankle and leg pathologies. And so um, when we start, when I start any ankle lecture, I always start with this video. So if you've seen it, um, forgive me, but essentially what you have um, is an ankle sprain. Uh, and we're going to take a look at this image or this video. Um, and then we'll say something so simple as an ankle sprain, right? Can it really be that detrimental to your patient? That's the question that I want you to keep in the back of your mind. Something so simple as an ankle sprain. Is it something that is that could really lead to long-term implications for your patient? So we'll start with the epidemiology of ankle sprains. Essentially what we know about ankle sprains is that there's about one ankle sprain per 10,000 people each day in the United States. So that essentially equates to about 23,000 ankle sprains that occur each day in the United States, right? That's an alarmingly high rate of ankle injuries or injuries just in general. We know about yearly data is about 2 million ankle sprains occur per year in the United States um, and that at least 70 different sports reported ankle injuries as the most commonly injured joint across those 70 different sports. So if nothing else, you know that you're going to see an ankle sprain at some point in time along your, your clinical career. What's even more alarming is the question that I asked originally is, is a simple acute ankle sprain something that leads to long-term implications for the patient? And the answer is yes. What we know about suffering from an acute ankle sprain is that the recurrence rate is through the roof. What do I mean by that? What we know about patients who have an initial ankle sprain is that 70% of those individuals will go on to restrain their ankle at least one time, and about 40 to 50% of those individuals will go on to suffer from chronic ankle instability. That means just walking across the street, you could roll your ankle because now your ankle is unstable. And so we look at this young lady um, as she walks down the, the crosswalk um, or the catwalk. And um, uh, first of all, I could never walk in hills that high, but certainly she gets much respect for being able to do that. You can already see she's a little wobbly, but she's making it. And then eventually, what do we see? We see massive inversion, eversion ankle sprains, but she's able to get through it, right? Well, there's this question in your mind as a clinician, right? Most times when an athlete suffers from an ankle sprain, most coaches will say, oh, it's no big deal, kind of walk it off. Um, what I'm hoping that you learn from this, these two online lectures is that we, an ankle sprain is much more than just an ankle sprain. And I'm hoping that by the time you finish this entire series, you'll learn that ankle sprains can lead to osteoarthritis, could lead to ankle replacements in relatively young student athletes. So it becomes important as healthcare clinicians to really truly make sure that you are treating the initial ankle sprain correctly so that it doesn't lead to long-term outcomes in your patients. So this is my final video before we get into the anatomy. I really want you to look at, at this video um, in particular as she finishes up her routine, right? And this is a gymnast. Clearly they take a little bit longer to get into the routine of things. But essentially what I want you to look at is what are um, the long-term implications for this athlete when she or he returns to play, in this case, when she returns to play, right? Play, pay close attention um, as she gets ready to, to load or land, right? What are the long-term implications? Something so simple, a tweak of the ankle, what are the long-term implications for these three patients that we've seen so far? So now that we're, we've gotten through what life looks like when we have an ankle sprain, we really need to talk about two different concepts. The first one's arthrokinematics, and the second one is osteokinematics. We're thinking about arthrokinematics. These are the, the very small amplitude motions of bones at a joint surface. So an example of this would be a bone spinning across another, a bone gliding across another, and then last but not least, a bone rolling across another. The hard thing with arthrokinematics is because they're such small amplitude motions and they occur between bones, we don't see those motions happening. We're talking millimeters, maybe even centimeters of movement, but it's these arthrokinematic motions that are important for the next term that I'm going to introduce, which is osteokinematic motion. 
Osteokinematic motion is what we visualize. It's what we see. It's the gross movement at the at the joint, right? So an example of a gross movement would be dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion, right? In order for those large, gross osteokinematic motions to occur, we had to have a bone spin or glide or roll across one another for that to actually happen, right? So we have this arthrokinematic motion, which is this motion that is very subtle that we don't see that happens between bones. And that arthrokinematic motion essentially produces osteokinematic motion, which is the larger gross movement of the bones, the, the movement that we see, knee flexion, ankle dorsiflexion, ankle plantar flexion, toe extension, right? Those are all osteokinematic motions that were driven by some sort of arthrokinematic motion deep to the skin uh, in relation to the two bones that were moving. So we have three joints that make up the actual ankle joint itself. We have the, the distotibial fibular joint. And I say distal because there is a proximal tibial fibular joint. And we'll talk about that when we get to the actual ankle joint or knee joint. And so for now, we're just going to refer to the distotibial fibular joint. We have the talocrural joint and the subtalar joint. And we'll talk about those independently because they do different things. So our first joint that we're going to talk about is the distotibial fibular joint. Uh, the distotibial fibular joint uh, is most responsible for assisting with ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Now, remember, we said dorsiflexion and plantar flexion were osteokinematic motions, right? So then how do those happen? Those happen as a result of arthrokinematic motions, right? And so those arthrokinematic motions that allow dorsiflexion to occur is that that fibula, this fibula right here, is going to glide superiorly. So it's going to glide upwardly and it's going to rotate laterally. So two things have to happen for us to get really good dorsiflexion at the ankle, in particular as it pertains to the distal tibial fibular joint. First and foremost, the fibula has to glide superiorly and then it has to kind of open up and rotate laterally, right? And that's if we want good maximum dorsiflexion. If we want maximum plantar flexion, right, if we want that osteokinematic plantar flexion, then the following arthrokinematic motions must occur. That fibula has to slide or glide inferior, and it has to, guess what, rotate medial, right? And so we have these arthrokinematic motions occurring so that an osteokinematic motion can occur. These all have to occur at the distotibial fibular joint for dorsiflexion to occur. Now notice we haven't talked about talocrural joint or subtalar cruel joint or subtalar joint yet because the reality inherent here is that um, different motions occur between different bones. For now, what we're referring to is what's happening to the fibula in relationship to the tibia. It's gliding superiorly, it's rotating laterally to um, have an osteokinematic motion, which is dorsiflexion. It's gliding inferiorly and rotating medially so that we can get maximum plantar flexion at the distal tibial fibular joint. Now we progress into the talocrural joint, happens to be my most favorite joint in the entire human body. We know about the talocrural joint is it represents the articulation between what two bones, right? So the um, proximal tibia, right? And the talus, right, essentially. And we can even add in there the fibula if we wanted to. The talocrural joint allows for one degree of freedom. Essentially, that's going to be dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So let's think about this. In the open kinetic chain, when the patient's foot is off the ground, what we know happens during dorsiflexion is the talus is going to glide posteriorly. Okay, let me say that again. If we want dorsiflexion to occur, if we want dorsiflexion to occur, bringing the toes up to the tibia, right, that talus has to glide posteriorly right? At the talocrural joint. If we want plantar flexion to occur, right? Then that talus is going to glide anteriorly and allow for plantar flexion to occur. Now these are motions that are happening at the talocrural joint. So I want to be very specific because if we rewind and we go back to the tibial fibular joint, that fibula is gliding superiorly and rotating laterally for dorsiflexion to occur. At the talocrural joint, however, if dorsiflexion wants to occur, we also have to have with it posterior glide of the talus, right? We can see how that movement or that glide of the talus is an arthrokinematic motion, which will produce an osteokinematic motion of dorsiflexion, right? So at the talocrural joint, we have movements of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And then last, but definitely not least, what I really want you to think about as it relates to the talocrural joint is this concept 
that there are degrees of motion that we have available to us as human beings, right? Uh, and so if we want maximum dorsiflexion to occur, that tail is, remember we said, has to glide posteriorly. If we want maximum plantar flexion to occur, that talus has to glide anteriorly at the talopural joint. What we know about degrees of, of motion at the talopural joint is that a patient should have about 20 degrees of dorsiflexion and about 50 degrees of plantar flexion. Now there is one caveat, it's in dancers. What we know about dancers is because they spend a lot of time in the point position, that most often they have about 70 degrees of plantar flexion range of motion uh, that they can get into but we're certainly looking at least for a 50 degrees, ideally, right? Anything outside of these norms would be considered uh, contraindicated or it may make you want to do some type of treatment, right? In order to improve that range of motion, to reduce risk of injury, right? And so these are normative values. Certainly, I will say this, you're gonna have a patient who comes to your clinic and only has 10 degrees of dorsiflexion range of motion, right? And so you're gonna say, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? We'll compare it, right, to the other side. Is it lacking compared to the other side? Or do both sides have 10 degrees of dorsiflexion range of motion? Do I have to change it? Are they perfectly fine living with 10 degrees of dorsiflexion range of motion? So you have to ask yourself multiple questions as you're assessing range of motion. But these are at least normative values for ranges of motion at the talocrural joint itself. Okay, next is the subtalar joint. And as the name implies, the subtalar joint represents that relationship in between the talus and the calcaneus. So it's this joint right here, right? So this is the talus, this is the calcaneus, and this is the subtalar joint itself. In terms of degrees of freedom, it also allows for one degree of freedom, but the degree of freedom is in supination and pronation. So it's, it's that combination of movements that you're going to see, right? Supination is most often accompanied by calcaneal inversion, right? Uh, and then pronation or flat foot is accompanied by calcaneal eversion. We know about inversion and eversion is the normative values for inversion are going to be 20 degrees of range of motion and for eversion about 10 degrees. And we can think, okay, well, why does a person most often have two times more degrees in inversion than they do in eversion? And you all would say to me, well, Dr. Cosby, it's because the fibula extends further down on the lateral side than, our, and than the tibia on the medial side, right? And so when we go into eversion, we get a block and that block is the fibula. Whereas on, in an inversion moment, we're allowed to invert more because that tibia just doesn't sit as low or as distal, right? So these are normative values and we will do this and lab will actually measure with a, a goniometer. So sit tight, don't get too stressed quite yet. Okay, so the supporting structures of the ankle. So these are structures that the talocrural joint and the subtalar joint and the distal tibial fibular joint all sit on. These are all structures that are instrumental in ankle integrity, right? And so let me backtrack and say, when I refer to the ankle, I refer to, I'm referring to three different joints. That's the distal tibial fibular joint, that's the subtalar joint, and that's the talocrural joint, right? So you can see the major supporting structures about the ankle are the foot intrinsics, right? And many of you probably breezed through gross anatomy and were like, yeah, um, foot intrinsic assignment doesn't mean anything. But when you look at the role of the foot intrinsics and um, the major supportive dynamic role that they play in foot integrity, structural integrity, then you really be begin to understand just how important it is to know their overall function, right? we know their overall function if we look at all of their attachments right it's to provide integrity or foot structure so that the the talus um, can sit on top of that calcaneus and do so in a stable environment any injury to those intrinsics right uh, and then we might see a more mobile foot which essentially means what and it essentially means we're absorbing more shock and we increase the risk of injury across the foot so the foot intrinsics are majorly important, even though they're not a part of ankle functional anatomy, they are a part of, of the ankle family in that they are the supporting dynamic structures, right, of, of ankle integrity. They are what the ankle joint actually sits upon. So any injury to them, and we have compromise to the ankle joint as, as well. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about supporting structures of the ankle, and our first stop is with the ligamentous integrity um, this is by far gets me excited. You probably can't tell because you can't see my face, but I love the lateral ligaments of the ankle. On the lateral side of the ankle, we have three ligaments. The first ligament is the anterior 
talofibular ligament. And if you ever get this mixed up, uh, the easiest way to think about this is which two bones do the ligaments attach to, right? This is on the anterior talus, right? And it's attaching to the fibula. So it's the anterior talofibular ligament. You can see in this anatomical structure, um, and this is a true cadaveric dissection, that the ATFL is actually bifurcated. So in other words, it's really two ligaments, but it's attachment. It is the only ligament that has a direct attachment to the talus. Let me say that again. It is the only ligament that has a direct attachment to the talus. What that means is, is when we sprain our ankle and we rupture this ligament, we no longer have any restraint or anything holding that talus in its place. And that will be bad for arthrokinematics of the ankle joint as we discuss ankle injuries, but it's a concept that you should understand now. We look at ligament number 18. Ligament number 18 is the calcaneal fibular ligament. So you can see it has this distal attachment to the calcaneus and then it has this proximal attachment to the fibula. And so it gets its name calcaneal fibular ligament we know about this ligament is that it's the major resistor to calcaneal inversion so any injury to it and we're going to see an increase in calcaneal inversion right we said normative was about 20 degrees so when you have a rupture of this calcaneal fibula ligament you could see 25 to 30 degrees of ankle inversion right same thing with the anterior talofibular ligament it is the major resistance to um, anterior talar talar translation so when it's ruptured, that talus is allowed to slide anteriorly, and guess what it has a hard time doing? It has a hard time translating posteriorly. It has a hard time getting posterior, which means osteo osteokinematically, which most shin is going to be lacking if that talus can't glide posteriorly. Did you all say dorsiflexion? If so, you got it. Last but not least is the posterior talofibular ligament. The posterior talofibular ligament's right here. You can see it here on this screen. It's then attached posteriorly to the talus and then right here to the distal uh, posterior fibula itself. So you can kind of see it here. Um, it's a beautiful ligament. Not surprising that it's not injured very often because of its anatomical location, right? So let's talk about the different lateral ligaments and their, um, their actual injury or susceptibility to injury. As you can see on this slide, the anterior talofibular ligament is the one that's often injured the most in most lateral ankle sprain mechanisms. And the reason for that has to do with its uh, mechanical stability and its ability to resist stress. What we know about the ATFL is it, of, of the three lateral ligaments, it has the lowest maximum load to failure. In other words, any load to it and it's going to give relatively easy, right? In the calcaneal fibular ligament, what we know is it has twice the maximum load to failure than the ATFL. Um, and so it's not as often injured as the ATFL, but it is the second most common injured ligament on the lateral side. And then last but not least, we have the posterior talofibular ligament, which has um, the highest maximum load to failure, and it's the least injured for that reason. And the other reason is in order to injure that posterior talofibular ligament, right, you're going to either have to be skydiving and land, right? Um, in a, massim, a maximally dorsiflex position, or you're going to have to take a blow to the anterior ankle. Those just don't happen very often. So again, PTFL injuries are extremely rare. About 90% of ankle injuries include the ATFL. About 70% include both the ATFL and the CFL. And I believe the stats say about 5% of ankle injuries include the PTFL, right? Okay, so as we continue to look at ligaments that support the ankle on the medial side of the ankle, um, in particular that support the talocoral joint, is the deltoid ligament. Um, and I love the deltoid ligament uh, a lot more now that I teach gross anatomy and we've actually dissected it out and looked at it from an anatomical perspective. I used to always think that the deltoid ligament was just one ligament. But you guys can see from this slide that the deltoid ligament is in fact four separate ligaments that come together, right, ultimately to make up the deltoid ligament. But as we look at this image, we can see that the, the, um, the one of the deltoid ligaments, the most central ligament, is this tibial calcaneal ligament. It's the one that's most often injured with an eversion mechanism, so just a pure eversion mechanism, right? Then you also have the tibial navicular ligament, and then you have Right here, you're going to have that um, posterior tibio talar ligament, right? And then the deep uh, tibio talar ligament. So you have all of these ligaments. And the cool thing about them is the way that they're laid, right? And the way that they're designed. 
So what we know about the tibiocalcaneal ligament is it's designed to resist only eversion forces, right? Like you can see that, you can see the way that the ligaments are laying down, that if we were to evert our ankle, then we certainly would sprain the tibiocalcaneal ligament. What we know about the um, superficial and deep posterior tibiotalar ligaments is that you would have to dorsiflex and evert to really tweak those, those ligaments and get them, right? And then on the anterior side of this, the tibionavicular ligament, plantar flexion to stretch it, right, coupled with some forefoot eversion would, would get that ligament. And you all might be saying like, this is too much, this is overload, but it's so important because it's changed the way that I actually treat medial ankle sprains in that when they come into me, you, I've always just palpated central, right? But there's a reality that we need to be palpating posterior and we need to be palpating anterior to make sure that we're not missing a bundle of the deltoid ligament. Another important um, component of this is when you're spatial testing. So let's take a look at this slide right here, right? This is the deltoid ligament. When you are spatial testing, there are def different degrees of dorsiflexion and pantoflexion that you should take the foot through um, to assess the different bundles of the deltoid ligament itself, right? Uh, and so this will become important because if you take the foot into plantar flexion, remember you're going to be testing that anterior tibio-navicular part. If you take the foot into dorsiflexion, then you're going to be assessing, right, this part, the posterior uh, tibio-talar, whether that's superficial and or deep. And then last but not least, with a neutral foot and an eversion mechanism, we're going to be assessing that tibio-calcaneal part. So foot position will tell us which part of the ligament we are stressing. And if you're picking up nothing else from this, you should be picking up the fact that you could miss something if you don't assess the deltoid in different um, positions of dorsiflexion and or plantar flexion. So we've talked about the ligamentous structures. We have the lateral ligaments. We have the medial ligament. And now we're actually going to talk about the muscle of the ankle. But honestly, this should be a pure review. So I'm hoping it's just that. We have the anterior compartment, and in the anterior compartment, we know that we have the tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis longus, and extensor digitorum longus. What I think is interesting about the anterior compartment, I'm assuming you learned this in gross anatomy, is the fibularis tertius, right? The fibularis tertius, which is a part of the fibularis group, lives in the anterior compartment, right? Because it doesn't cross the axis. And so all of these muscles together, right, concentrically contract to control or to cause dorsiflexion range of motion. Some would even argue secondarily they cause toe extension, right? Because you have those extensors and they're innervated by the deep peroneal nerve, right? So any injury or compromise to the deep peroneal nerve and most likely that patient's gonna have foot drop, right? They're gonna lose the ability to dorsiflex their foot. On the lateral compartment, what we have are the two fibulari muscles, longus and brevis, right? These uh, longus and brevis muscles are supplied by the superficial peroneal nerve and their major role at, at the foot concentrically and at the ankle concentrically is to evert the foot, so to maximally evert the foot. We can also see that the ret retinaculum, sorry, um, is also included in the lateral compartment. So because it's a retinacular structure, most often in gross anatomy, we don't talk about it as being a part of the lateral compartment but they are responsible, you can see it here, the retinaculum, superior and inferior, they are what's responsible for making these lateral compartment structures. You see how they hold them um, in their own access versus if these were injured, they probably would cross over the fibula and become anterior compartment muscles. So these retinacula are actually extremely important in maintaining compartment integrity and making sure that they stay lateral compartment muscles. So again, um, ultimate goal of this compartment is to concentrically contract and evert the foot and it's supplied by the superior superficial peroneal nerve, right? And we can look at this again and I love this image because it shows us two things. It shows us the compartments, right? So the lateral compartment and the anterior compartment, but the focus is really on that, the tertius, right? You can see how it's not crossing that that fibula, right? And so because it crosses over on the anterior aspect of the fibula, it's in the anterior compartment and it becomes a very small dorsiflexor, right? Uh, and then of course, it's an everter, just like it's peroneal um, sister and brother, right? And then we can see how the fibulari brevis and longus or peroneus brevis and longus 
our lateral compartment muscles because they fall posterior to that fibula or more lateral to that fibula, making them lateral compartment muscles and making their angle of pull such that the foot is uh, concentrically going into eversion. Next, we have the posterior compartment. And as you guys know, it's broken up into superficial and deep. So let's talk superficial first. Superficial compartment is composed of which muscles? Yeah, the gastrox, right? Uh, deep to the gastrox. If you were to transect and reflect the gastrox, we would then see what? Yes, the soleus. And then you have the very small muscle belly of the plantaris, which I'm hoping you all learned that the plantaris is really used for what? It's really used for Tommy John surgeries, right? In baseball pitchers. Clip it, use the tendon because it's such a long tendon and structure to replace the UCL in the actual elbow. Overall, though, the muscles of the posterior compartment, superficial posterior compartment, are plantar flexors, right? Concentrically, they contract to plantar flex the foot. And then last but not least, we have the muscles of the deep posterior compartment. The muscles of the deep posterior compartment are the tibialis posterior, which to me, the way I think about this is it's closest to the tibia. You have the flexor digitorum longus, uh, and then you have the flexor callosus longus. And these represent Tom, Dick, and Harry. Their major role in the foot concentrically is to pull the foot into inversion, right? Uh, many of them will also assist with plantar flexion and toe flexion. The superficial and deep compartments are supplied by the tibial nerve. So if that was a lot for you, uh, I think the take home points would, would be here, right? You could look at this myology summary and say, okay, uh, concentrically plantar flexion, that's gonna be gastroc and soleus, concentrically dorsiflexion, that's going to be tibialis anterior. So these are the motions of the foot and the ankle, and these are the muscles that are concentrically contracting to control those muscle movements. Now, there are uh, two bursae in the ankle joint, um, and they are located on the posterior aspect of the calcaneus. Isn't that amazing? Just think the posterior aspect of the calcaneus is going to be making contact with the foot. And so I think it's amazing that God created our foot in such a way that we have bursa to protect us as we wear shoes, right? Or as our foot's engulfing shoes pretty much 99.9% .9 of our day, unless we're flip-flop wearers, right? But what we know about these bursa is if we continue to wear shoes and we rub, they're going to get irritated at some point in time, right? So there are two bursa, as you can see them here. We have this bursa here and we have this bursa here. The first bursa is the deep bursa. It's the subtendinous calcaneal bursa. It is the bursa between the Achilles tendon, right, and the actual calcaneus. And then we have the subcutaneous superficial calcaneal bursa. So it is the bursa between the Achilles and the actual skin. So the subcutaneous calcaneal bursa is the one that most often gets injured the most and will flare up um, when you wear tight, tight shoes or when you're in, let's say, soccer cleats that you haven't worn yet. Uh, it's usually the subcutaneous calcaneal bursa that usually gets inflamed most Typically don't see the subtendinous calcaneal bursa get inflamed unless, of course, like a, you know, you're a soccer athlete and the athlete goes to kick the ball and kicks your calcaneus. Typically that will elicit a painful response. Um, so those are the bursa that help prevent friction or rubbing across the calcaneus itself. Okay, in terms of clinical examination of the ankle and leg, just like with the foot, we talked about specific historical questions that we would ask our patients. So in terms of the ankle and leg, we're going to ask about past medical history. In fact, one of the number one predictors of a, another ankle sprain is previous history of an ankle sprain. So the first historical question that we want to ask is, have you ever injured your ankle before? I know that seems like common sense, but not have you ever injured your leg before. It's have you specifically injured your ankle before? That's the number one predictor, the number one history question that we should ask someone with an ankle sprain or an ankle injury. So with that said, um, history of present condition, we're gonna ask about location of pain, the onset of pain, the mechanism of injury, and we wanna know the type and severity of pain because this can tell us whether or not it's a fracture versus if it's a sprain. We wanna know pain pattern. This will tell us if it's a strain, right? Before, after, during, and then changes in any changes in activity and conditioning regimen. So or we're looking for overuse injury. So these are the historical questions that we're going to ask. Um, our patients when they come into the clinic. In particular, this one becomes important when you're 
suspecting an overuse injury? Have they changed their shoes? Have they changed their activity? Did they train on cement and now they're training on sand? Did they train on sand and now they're training on cement? Did they increase their mileage? What did they do that caused this injury? In particular, if it's a chronic repetitive injury. In terms of um, inspection, right? So we're at history, now we're at inspection. Essentially what we want to look for are a few different things. On the um, medial side, we're gonna be looking at the medial malleolus and the medial longitudinal arch, right? So this would be the tibia and then all of the bony structures that make up the medial longitudinal arch. That would be what? The navicular, the first ray, the cuneiforms, right? So we're looking at all of those bony structures. The posterior structures, most often that's going to be the tricep serrae. We're also going to assess that, that Achilles, and then last but not least, the calcaneus and the, the bursa. And then as we progress laterally, what we want to look at is the peroneal muscle group. Are they intact? Are they, is there ecchymosis around that area? Want to palpate that, that fibula. And then the lateral malleolus. And then anteriorly, we want to look at the sinus tarsi. And the sinus tarsi we'll be able to see better in lab, but it is the sweet spot. It's the spot. It's a cavity that typically when we injure our, our ankle, the swelling goes into because it's an empty cavity. And so sweat water in the sinus tarsi or effusion in the sinus tarsi will allow us to know if in fact they have edema or effusion. And I want to look at the contour of the malleoli because that's going to tell us if they have a fracture and or not. And then last but not least, we want to palpate that talus because remember I said there's only one ligamentous attachment. If that ATFL gets sprained, what we'll see with the talus is that it'll be sitting more anterior, which, which means it makes it easier to palpate, and so you'll feel it better. Last but definitely not least, what we want to talk about is function, right? Um, you probably saw that on the inspection phase, but it becomes extremely important here and right now. So we've done the history, we've done the inspection, we've done the palpation, and now we're kind of moving into the special task slash functional test and so just like with the foot and the um, toes, we want to make sure that we're assessing active range of motion first, and that would include plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, and inversion eversion. So we're assessing talar pole joint, right? The tibiofibular joint, and then we're also assessing subtalar joint with that inversion eversion. So we're assessing the integrity of all three joints when we do all four movements. So we're going to do active range of motion, then we'll do passive range of motion, and then last but not least, we'll do manual muscle testing. And you can think about manual muscle testing and say, well, manual muscle testing of what? Well, of the tibialis anterior, so the anterior compartment of the fibulari muscle group, the lateral compartment, plantar flexion, which would be the deep posterior compartment, and then inversion, which would be this, the, sorry, plantar flexion, which would be the superficial posterior compartment, and then um, inversion, which would be the deep posterior compartment. I can get that. Last but not least are our joint special tests. And I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of time talking about each of them because we have a whole lab dedicated to that, but we'll finally have to do the joint stability test. And that's gonna be stress testing of the ligaments, which will be um, all of the lateral ligaments, the medial ligament, right? And then we're gonna assess joint play and stability of the tibiofibular joint. Uh, I hope that this has been pretty much a review, but that you learned some new um, concepts about the anatomy of the ankle joint. If anything else, you guys should understand that the ankle joint just isn't the injury that we blow off. It actually has huge implications um, for a history of ankle sprain, for setting our patients up to be um, chronic ankle sprainers. And so it becomes important you know, that we assess and treat it like we would any other acute injury. Just not, we just shouldn't tape it and return them to play.